Hello everybody and welcome to this podcast about our mobile phone security survey. Talking to you today, we have myself, Stephen Fennell, and Nathan Clark. And we're both from the Centre for Security Communications and Network Research at Plymouth University. This survey work builds on some previous research that we've conducted around users' awareness of security for their mobile devices. And particularly in this version of the survey, we're looking to examine people's current use of mobile phones to assess the level of security problems and misuse that they experience, to understand whether they're currently using any security measures, and if so, which ones they are, and to determine the extent to which security is felt to be a priority for them and what they feel they ought to be doing about it in that case. So Nathan can give a little bit of a background to how the study was conducted and how it builds upon some of our previous research. Sure. So the study was conducted during uh, the middle of 2011, with 341 respondents taking part and 301 surveys fully completed. It was the latter figure that we actually used um, in the analysis being presented today. It's worth pointing out at this stage that kind of the survey for us is, as Steve's indicated, part of a wider part of research and it's a um, almost duplication of a previous survey we undertook back in 2004. And, and really the purpose of, of this survey was to reflect upon what's changed over those intervening eight years and to look at if any trends and patterns have evolved or changed or have really developed. It's worth also pointing out at this stage that the conduct of the survey itself was done as part of an MSc project by Jane Symes. And so it's thanks to her that we're able to report some results here. So let's begin by looking at some of the the demographic details and background of the survey respondents. So if we look at the age groups, unsurprisingly for us, a large proportion of the participants come from the 18 to 25 group. And that's largely reflective of Jane's dissemination plan in the sense of using Facebook, email and other electronic means of obtaining participants. This in itself is not a major issue in the sense that we weren't actually looking at the relationship age has upon particular security considerations. So in a sense that the skew towards the younger age groups isn't overly surprising because what we're looking at here is perhaps the more technology literate segment of the population and particularly if we look at the largest three segments it's more likely representative of those users those respondents who've grown up with the technology to some degree. Taking a look at the demographics a little bit further and we look at the educational background we also see there's a skew here towards those with higher degrees of education so those with undergraduate postgraduate degrees or foundation degrees. Again, likewise with the age, this isn't necessarily a particular problem for us in terms of the analysis, but it is, again, an indication of a group of users that would be, or more likely to be, those users that have a a better understanding of technology, um, a better understanding of the security implications of the technology they use. So we would expect to see potentially more favourable figures towards security through this analysis. So if we now move on to consider aspects of the use of the technology that the respondents were claimed to be making and also the potential for misuse that they would encounter as a result. So looking at this slide, first of all, what we've got here is a ranked list of the different applications and services that were presented as options within the survey and asking the respondents to indicate the frequency with which these different applications and services were used by them. And so you can see what we've got here is breakdowns according to things that they claim to use on a daily basis, a weekly basis, less frequently than that, never used at all, or in some cases features that weren't available on the particular type of handset that they owned. Um, So perhaps unsurprisingly, what we can see here is that the most popular application or service, depending on how you look at it, is the use of short message service the text messaging. And this actually mirrors some recent findings from Ofcom um, reported earlier this month, so July 2012, indicating that people, at least in the UK, are now more likely to be sending text messages than making phone calls with their mobile phone devices. And it's probably a a nice interesting comparison if we look at this chart and compare it to the, the chart we had in 2004. Pretty much in terms of the services back in 2004 were telephony, SMS and some form of information service. For those of you who remember information services, that's an SMS-based service. So in contrast to 2011, we see a whole variety of new applications and services now being provided, whether that be via the App Store, Marketplace, or any other technology. Um, So the mobile phone, in terms of what it's able to do now, has dramatically changed. Back in 2004, it was primarily a telephony device. That no longer holds true. Another observation we can make just looking at the more popular of the the services there is many of these are going to be things that are going to be routinely holding personal and potentially sensitive data as part of their usage. So things around social networks, around email for example, 
around the, the content of SMSs. These are all things that perhaps users ought to be taking an interest in protecting as part of their use of the devices. And perhaps less encouragingly for those mobile operators that thought the, the killer application for 3G networks and beyond were going to be things around video conferencing, we can see that that is demonstrably the least popular or the least utilised of the services available on many of the handsets. It's worth highlighting, if we look at GPS technologies down there, it has a relatively small amount of user participation. I do wonder anecdotally whether people are actually aware that many of the services and applications they use on a phone are actually using the GPS service in the background. Um, to take a particular example, for instance, social networking. and um, We have relatively high usage of social networking on a daily, weekly basis, and many of those applications now use GPS uh, as kind of an inherent part of the application itself. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree. I think almost certainly the interpretation that many of the respondents would have made based on the way it was presented in the survey was here just the use of GPS in a navigational context. Okay, if we move on to the next slide, what we're looking at now is the, the proportion of time per day that the respondents reported having their devices switched on and enabled. And uh, as is very clear, you can see that the majority of people are having it on in an always-on scenario. Yes, and again, comparing this against the 2004 study, what we've seen here is, is a completely different way in which we use our mobile phones. So back in 2004, it was far more normal for, for users to switch the device off, particularly during the night. However, now it's far more custom. You leave the device on, you simply put it on a standby mode, um, and the device remains continuously on. And obviously, this fact that it's always on ha has some serious implications in terms of security and whether the user is actually required to enter any kind of PIN or password-based information on the device itself. Many users now actually have forgotten what the, the power on PIN is um, simply because the device doesn't actually ever get switched off and the users never ask for it again. And around the issue of the PIN authentication, this is something that we'll come on to consider specifically later on within the discussion. But the key message here is, in terms of the way that people are using the technology, it's now increasingly always on and they are always accessible. So we also decided to look at some of the other networking technologies that we now find on a mobile phone. And we chose the two primary standards, Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi. This has various implications for us, both from the security perspective and also in terms of the users using the device. Previously, back in 2004, these technologies were not widely used. So everything came via the network itself. The network operator had effectively ultimate control over the mobile device. And now with these additional networks, we've got data and information and connectivity coming through from different directions. And this opens up opportunities, obviously, for misuse and for people getting access to the device, and also opportunities for various pieces of malware and so on and so forth. So if you look at actually in terms of who's using this, we can see in terms of Bluetooth, you know, we've got always on about 12%, sometimes 11%. And um, these are relatively small proportions of users. And I think that the message about Bluetooth both being power hungry and power consuming and also a potential security issue has probably reflected in this number in terms of reducing it. And you mentioned there about malware and I don't think to date at least either of the, these particular routes have proven to be that prominent as means for infecting mobile devices. I think where we're seeing more of the activity around mobile device malware is things coming in in terms of apps now and that could be downloaded via Wi-Fi, could be downloaded equally well via the cellular network. But I think a, a key thing is that the devices themselves have more connectivity and to at least some degree there's evidence of people using that, particularly or more particularly there with the Wi-Fi. If we move on to consider the types of problems that the respondents reported encountering with their devices, they were given a number of options as part of the survey questions. And what we can see here were pretty much dominated around issues of lost devices and devices being used by other people, so the category that we represented as borrowed devices. So this is perhaps something where if they've perceived it to be a threat, this is where their device has been used by somebody else, potentially without their authorization to do so. So it will, again, track back to this issue around authentication on the device that we'll come to later. Perhaps notable is that the very small number um, at this stage of people who've reported incidents around malicious software 
on the handsets. And it's worth flagging or reminding again that this survey was conducted around mid-2011. And since that time, there's been a demonstrable increase in the number of new strains of malicious software specifically targeting mobile device platforms. In particular, at the time of talking about it, at least, in terms of the Android platform. And with some of the antivirus vendors reporting seeing more strains in the last few months than they've seen over previous periods of years. So if we were to uh, compare and contrast, for instance, some of the figures here against the 2004, we can see that 13% of individuals have had a, a stolen device, up from 5% in 2004, 29% have, have had a lost device, and 32% have experienced some form of borrowed device theft. Just to pick up the point Steve made earlier, I, I'd like to focus really on the first three categories of stolen, lost, and borrowed a little bit more, in the sense that if we start to tie these categories together with um, how the mobile phone operates and, and how it works, we start to envisage an environment where we've got devices that are always on, we have devices that have larger connectivity, and devices that are storing and accessing a wider range of information. And under that kind of environment, we've also got theft and misuse increasing. And, and it's that kind of area from an information security perspective that that starts to introduce concern for us. So what it is, is certainly a more valuable asset that is exposed to a greater level of physical vulnerability. So there are certain safeguards that people can employ to combat this, and as I say, we'll move on to see the extent to which they're currently doing so. So if we look then at the security practices that people currently claim to undertake on their devices, the first is a general range of security controls, and we've got the percentage of respondents that claim to currently be using them. And I suppose the first observation we can make is none of these rise above 25% for any of the technologies listed. Now, notably here, we're excluding authentication on the device, so use of pins or passwords, we'll come on to that. But it's interesting to see the range of other technologies, which to some degree we might regard as commonplace on the desktop, not being at all commonplace as practices in use or even considerations for users on their mobile devices. But if I had to contrast this against 2004, then the, the positive we can take from here is there are a wide range of applications now that are providing security countermeasure functionality. So back in 2004, it was very much authentication was, was the primary and single only mechanism to secure your, your device and your information. A lot of trust was placed in the network operator to ensure that you only got the information you're looking for and you weren't getting anything else in terms of malware or anything else. However, I agree with Steve in the sense that the levels of uptake um, of these technologies is all relatively low, particularly in an environment where now smartphones are pretty much ubiquitous, particularly against the, the target population we happen to have in this particular respondent base. A particular thing if we look at the antivirus, anti-spyware result there, where you've got something around 7% of respondents saying that they use that, you contrast that with surveys that are out and around, around traditional desktop and laptop technologies, where the, the normal result is high 90s percentage of usage, or at least having something installed. And you see that there's a, likely to be a significant cultural difference in the way that people regard their mobile technology as compared to their traditional desktop operating system environment. And as increasing malware threats are now tending to emerge on the mobile device, I think there is a significant potential for people to be caught napping, in a sense, that it's something that they've not had to deal with in this context, and they're, so, they're far more exposed, or their devices and data are far more exposed as a result. So we also asked the respondents about the frequency of backup. You know, backup is one of those security countermeasures that's essential in order to ensure that you can get at your information when you need to. And as we can see from the statistics, 32% have never backed up at all, going through to 12% having a weekly backup, and the intervening periods kind of a, a diminishing from 2015, 21 to 12. So what this is really showing us is actually there's a, a large proportion, you know, of over 50% have either never or once backed up their device, which really isn't given the amount of information and, and the amount of data being stored and transferred across these devices is by no means sufficient. So again, what it's really doing is giving an indication of, again, compared to the way that perhaps some people are used to dealing with their data on traditional desktop devices or perhaps expecting that data, for example, in a corporate context will be backed up for them, this culture of dealing with data and handling it appropriately perhaps hasn't made the transition over to our use of mobile devices that really it needs to if we're going to be using them in a proper protected fashion.
It, it is possibly worth noting also that um, this category of question might also have um, resulted in some error in, in the sense that with a lot of smartphones, particularly Android and iPhone based smartphones now, will actually perform backups relatively automatically without the user necessarily being aware that such backups are being made. So perhaps the figures are actually slightly more positive than these figures would, would lead to suggest. Okay, moving on then to that one category of security measure that was omitted from the earlier chart around the user's authentication of themselves onto the device. We, we had some specific emphasis on the use of PIN, personal identification number, and password type mechanisms on the devices. And as you can see from the chart, there's a number of different contexts in which pins or passwords can be utilized on a mobile device. Um, so f just to explain these, we've got the context of when the phone is actually, if you like, physically switched off and powered on. We've got the context of when the phone is left in standby mode, which is the normal thing for smartphones these days when you press the button, it blanks the screen, but the phone is still active, able to receive calls, etc. And then you've got different aspects that may have their own pin. So um, the standard elements of the phone, if you like, that link it to being your device with your account are the combination of the, the SIM, the subscriber identification module, and the phone handset itself. And both of these can have their own distinct PIN numbers. So particularly with the SIM, as Nathan mentioned earlier, if, it, if it's a user who keeps their phone switched on all the time, they've not had to physically reset the device, then they might not come into contact with the SIM PIN on a very frequent basis. They might have to do so, or might have to enter it, when they've switched the phone on and it's completely reset. Whereas the phone PIN, as we've indicated it here, is the one that gets utilised if they've elected to have a pin that activates when the phone's in standby or not been actively used for a period of time. To also follow up in a little bit more detail with the figures, because of the, uh, the difficulty in understanding exactly what these different pin settings are, I, I would imagine many of the respondents wouldn't necessarily have known how to, to answer each of the separate categories. So I, I'm more interested really in looking at the numbers more broadly than any specific category. And what we can generally see here is about 50% of the respondents in any one category really are not using the PIN. And if you were to multiply this up in terms of the mobile phone subscribers, you know, we're talking over half the subscriber base of about 6 billion people not using authentication. Now, it's perhaps worth just highlighting you know, why we're focusing upon authentication in particular in terms of um, separating this one out from the other countermeasures. And the reason for that really is because the mobile phone itself, as Steve has alluded to, has a slightly different security perspective in terms of other desktop or other computing environments in that it's physically vulnerable to misuse and abuse. These devices tend to get lost, stolen, um, left in taxis, at ca cafes, at bars, so on and so forth. And the only security countermeasure in that particular environment that can help protect the information and help protect access to that device is the authentication mechanism. So it is somewhat concerning to see that just under or, or just over half the participants um, in this particular survey are not actually using any form of authentication security. If we make a brief comparison to the results from our previous run of this survey back in 2004, we had 66% of respondents then stating that they used a PIN in some form. And so really this usage and this understanding certainly hasn't advanced according to the findings that we're observing in the intervening seven years or so. Against the backdrop of significant technology enhancement in, in, in change from a telephony device through to a, a, a multi-communication, multi-service device that can store gigabytes of data. Okay, if we move on to consider another PIN-related thing, what, what we also asked them was around the practices of resetting, changing their PIN. Now, of course, with traditional passwords, this becomes part of the standard advice that users will receive, that they ought to change their passwords on a regular basis. Um, what we found back in 2004 with the survey was that 45% of people never changed their PIN at all, and only 13% had ever changed it more than once. So what we're seeing here is, again, some interesting behaviour in the sense that quite a number of people have never changed the pin at all, which means that they didn't change it from the default that came out of the box. Therefore, anybody who gets hold of that handset and can web search for what the default pin on the device would be is going to have a good chance of getting into it. And some people had only changed it after purchase. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, many people aren't changing it on a more frequent basis than that. The perhaps hidden wrinkle here is whether people are using the same pin for their phone as they might be using for other aspects of things and services they, they have with them. Now, I think this is a, a useful example where we can compare actually against desktop use. 
you know, I think maybe going back 15, 20 years, perhaps we didn't change our password particularly regularly on these these types of technology. However, now we are we are taught and almost forced by by our organisations in a corporate environment, at least, to make sure these are reset on a monthly, if not even weekly basis. So whilst it's not unsurprising to see that we're not changing the pin very often on the phone, it, it is a practice that we certainly need to start thinking about doing. And given the fact we've seen little change from the 2004 survey through to this survey, it's somewhat concerning that, that things haven't begun to move on a, a little bit further. What we do see in the, uh, the chart here is a potential anomaly in the results where 2% of the respondents claim that they're resetting their pin on a daily basis. Not quite sure what explains this other than perhaps a misunderstanding of the question because it's, I would consider, highly unlikely that many respondents are actually changing their pin that frequently. I, I would agree. That uh, must be a particularly security conscious participant or two there. <laughs> it's also worth observing that we've got 8% there who don't know, which uh, again suggests uh, perhaps a lesser degree of acquaintance with the authentication on their devices than we would perhaps like to see them having. It's perhaps worth re reflecting in terms of the don't know category a little bit further in the sense that what we've seen in other technology areas is, is when security is not enabled by default, there are participants or, or individuals more specifically that have no awareness that that functionality even exists. And that 8% there might be actually a, a proportion of the participant base that really didn't know what the pin was, didn't know it existed, didn't know they could protect the device. And the analogy I can make here very much in terms of technology is the use of wireless access points and wireless networks in homes. Many years ago, there were no security mechanisms for protecting, no WEP key or WPA key, and lots of these access points were left open and unsecured completely. It was only through a change within the industry itself that that actually pushed security onto devices to a default enabled status rather than default off that actually changed people's perspectives. Devices now are inherently secure. People don't need to worry about them. They don't need to think about the functionality. It's just there from initial switch on. And that might be a, a direction where operators and manufacturers need to start thinking about in terms of the provision of security on devices and rather than a, is a nice option or a nice additional piece of functionality, whether it's something that should be uh, default enabled. Okay, having looked at the different practices that the respondents claim to have around their security, it's interesting then to contrast it with the level of concern that they claim to have around the need for security and the need to protect their devices and data. So if we look at this chart here, what it's giving is a, a fairly different perspective actually when you compare it to the number of safeguards and the extent to which they were used. So we have almost a third of respondents saying that they're very concerned about the security of their device and more than another third saying that they're somewhat concerned. So the vast majority of respondents are concerned about security and it's, a, I say, a significant contrast to the extent to which they're using the current safeguards that are available to them. Yes, no, I, I agree completely. You know, if we actually look at those that are, are unconcerned, they only make up 10% of the, the participants. Everybody else either is concerned or really either don't know or, or, or are neutral in, in their considerations. And re-emphasising that point, really, was another question that we asked them, would you want more security on your device? So, so fundamentally start yes or no a response required, and we can see there that almost two-thirds have responded positively to that. That, that contrasts with around 85% of respondents saying, yes, they wanted more back in the 2004 survey. Interesting contrast, I guess, in the sense that the devices now can do substantially more, as Nathan mentioned earlier, and holding substantially more sensitive information. Perhaps some people now are feeling they're using the, the safeguards available to them more, and so they feel they've got enough. But still, the fundamental observation that we can make, which is the same as back in 2004, people aren't using very much of the safeguards that are are available to them, but they demonstrably want more security than they've currently got. So this is perhaps saying something about the usability, the accessibility of the technologies as currently provided. Well, the one thing I would add to Steve's comments really is, if we look at the 63% of participants desiring more security, that's against the backdrop of very few participants actually implementing countermeasures. So in 2011, the countermeasures are actually there, people can actually install them and use them. Yet people obviously aren't, and Steve's given some indications for why that might be the case. Whereas obviously back in 2004, where we had 85% wanting additional security, there were few controls actually that people could actually use. So they wanted more security, but they didn't really know how that might manifest itself. Now we've got those controls, but people still really aren't engaging with them to the degree we would like, or necessarily to the degree they would like, given their desire for more security. So one fundamental question coming off of this is they want more security, but perhaps they don't see it as their role to be providing it. 
And so another question we ask is, whose role is it? Whose responsibility is it to be providing security and dealing with it? And well, what we can see here is a, a fairly even split between some of the categories. We can see that the users do consider themselves, you know, at least partially, to have a responsibility, but there are also other stakeholders who are believed to have a significant role. So mobile operators and manufacturers of the handsets to make the services and the features available in the first instance. Relatively few people um, saying that it's the responsibility of an employer, but this is perhaps reflecting the fact we were dealing with respondents as individual private users as opposed to talking about technology that had been issued to them in an employment context. And, and I think this is a very interesting result. It, it's a kind of a very mature response from the participants in the sense that they understand that it's actually a responsibility for all those involved into trying to improve security within the device itself. It's no single stakeholder's responsibility here. It actually requires effort from more directions in, in order to improve the overall information security. It's also worth noting that even though the employers might not consider themselves responsible in this context, they may still have an interest in ensuring that the users are making use of safeguards on their devices if those devices are actually holding corporate company business-related data. So we decided to ask the, the participants a further question about actually how they would like to get the security. And we provided a, a series of options for them. Default, present and active, which effectively means that the device out of the box has all of the security countermeasures all installed, all operating and all running from initial power on. Second option was default, deactive, which means again, all those countermeasures are present, but they're simply deactivated and, and require the user to actually go in and switch the ones they want on. No security features at all. And then the fourth category was user defined via third party applications and third party downloads. And what we can see here is, is the largest proportion of participants, 84% of the participants, wanted default, present, and active, which very much comes back to the point I was making earlier in terms of the, the wireless access networks and so on and so forth. It, it, it appears users want the security applications on the device, they want them present, they want them to be best protected, and I guess. Should they deem particular security measures begin to inhibit their, their interactivity or their functionality, then, then they have the option to go in and, and to disable or switch them off or modify their settings. But, but the key finding here is certainly they, they want all the countermeasures on the device and to be active straight out of the box. Okay, one other question that we asked as part of the survey was around alternative means of authentication. This particularly for us reflects part of the research interest we have here at Plymouth University, looking at alternative ways of enabling users to verify or prove their identity to a mobile device. And we've done some primary research around areas such as keystroke analysis, which is looking at somebody's keypad or touchscreen interactions to authenticate them by the way that they're entering information. And we're also looking at architectures that bring together the potential for using different biometrics to have different signals about the legitimacy of the user in different contexts depending on what they're doing. And so given that um, many respondents were now likely to be familiar with the concept of biometrics at least, and in several cases through things like face recognition and fingerprint recognition becoming more popular in the marketplace, might actually have had some first-hand experience of using them, we asked them their interest or their, their likely acceptance of these technologies as the basis for authentication on their mobile devices. And so we can see the results here. And if we broadly look across the categories there, there are a number of um, approaches that score above 50%. You know, fingerprint, voice, iris scanning, Android scheme, which is one of the Android swipe schemes. It's not a biometric itself. And, and the graphical password. So there are a number of other approaches that are deemed favourable but by a good proportion of the participants. You know, I feel the 82% the of the fingerprint is very much due to the fact that the fingerprint technologies it is the most mature biometric out there. It, it's the one single approach that most people are going to be aware of and many probably have used given its introduction now on, on keyboards and laptops and so on and so forth and it's obviously a very popular approach that, that people would, would be happy to use. The key finding for us in terms of authentication is, is, is the pin really isn't fit for purpose, it hasn't been for a very very long time. Um, our 2004 survey has shown that, the 2011 survey has also shown that and um, what both these surveys have also indicated is that there are alternative techniques out there. These techniques are favoured by participants, um, yet there seems to be a reluctance by manufacturers and by the industry to want to incorporate new and different technologies. Now that comment is said with, with a, a slight exception in that we are beginning to see some slight changes in this kind of space. You know, Android and its swiping mechanism 
and more recently the latest version of Android uh, has included facial recognition. So manufacturers are beginning to understand that the need for, for alternative authentication mechanisms, but it's worth pointing out for, for us, particularly if I give the, the Android example, facial recognition um, by Android's own admission it is not as strong as using the PIN mechanism. So its particular implementation of facial recognition is far more designed for usability in mind than it is actually security. Yeah, we've actually got that little video of, uh, of you spoofing the authentication there by holding up a photograph of yourself on another phone up against your, your Android phone and it's successfully unlocking. So yes, indeed. Yeah. Anybody unfortunate enough to have a picture of you could get into your phone. Exactly, exactly. But as, as I say, it's not something that uh, uh, Google are trying to hide, that they make you aware that, that the facial recognition really isn't there. Um, and if you want something more secure, you have to go back to the pin. Yet we know the pin is not a secure mechanism either. So there's still a lot of scope in this, in this area to, to improve upon what we're actually doing here in terms of authentication. And just to clarify, that one that's on the, the slide that you mentioned labelled as Android scheme, that's the pattern unlock? Yes. Okay. All right, so bringing us to some sort of conclusion, let's draw out some of the main points that we observed through this survey. So certainly the respondents that we surveyed seem to be aware of security issues, or at least wanting a greater level of security to protect their devices, but they weren't utilising fundamentally what was already available to them in many contexts. So setting aside backup, um, there were none of the other security controls that had anything larger than a 17% take-up um, other than the PIN in some of the contexts as mm -hmm. well. And what we're seeing, you know, in terms of misuse here, you know, 56% of respondents have been affected through some form of misuse. You know, this is a significant level of misuse, particularly when we start to multiply through the numbers. So the need for better protection on these devices, um, it kind of stands in its own right. There's a need for more security. Users are wanting more security, but there's this disparity between wanting and, and actually not using what's currently available. And certainly looking at the, the potential alternatives, at least in concept, the idea of biometrics comes out quite favourably. Uh, and I think the key thing here is that the response are potentially accepting of security being done in different ways. So it's not an outright rejection of security technology, but the fact that they want it presented to them and provided for them in ways that are actually more convenient for the type of device that they're using. So where you're dealing with something frequently in and out of their pocket, for example, something that's coming out for short bursts of use, the overhead, if you like, of having to type in even a pin is perhaps sometimes not the level to which they're prepared to go. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to us. I uh, hope you found it interesting. Our contact details are there on the slide, so please feel free to email us or indeed to follow us on Twitter and indeed to visit our Research Centre website where we've got more information about the research that we're conducting, including a number of papers around the, the prior research and ongoing research that we're doing in terms of the authentication technologies for mobile devices. Thank you very much. Thank you.